Spike Lee. That's probably my favorite movie of his. And then uh, Ben and I have a buddy that was the music supervisor for the club scene. You know, the club scene in that movie? Yeah. Uh, our buddy Bobito Garcia arranged all that. He's like a legendary New York hip hop DJ. Okay, so we're in that period of time where we're filling in the pews. People are starting to come in to the Whiskey Church and uh, we'll be here momentarily. So linger and meander amongst yourselves while we wait. What we'd like to do, everybody that's watching, uh, as you see on your screen, you see Jared, you see Alex, you see Ben, you see myself. If you've been to Whiskey Talk before, you're accustomed to that. We're going to hand around the collection plates and uh, go ahead as they go up and down the pews and you guys are filling out the pews. Feel free to put whatever you would like into that collection plate. <laughs> and of course, it will all go back to the Whiskey Gods because uh, that's what this is all about. How you guys been? How we doing, Jared? Good, man. It's plugging away. Hang in there. I'm really excited to uh, talk about lineage. We're going to do the whole uh, single malt jam today, but uh, we're going to work our way to uh, lineage. I'm very excited about that. Alex, how are things on the streets in your life, my friend? Um, good. I uh, I guess I technically didn't, but my wife just had a baby, so. Uh, congratulations. I you. saw that on the Instagrams. Uh, mm -hmm. congratulations. That's really awesome stuff, dude. Yep. Yep. Her, uh, her name is, uh, Ben. So, um, yeah. it's, a, it's like some connection. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good. Enough. Good. Uh, trying to, you know, get back into the fold, the swing of things working from home was already kind of part of the, part of the deal with, uh, this, this pandemic. So, um, the launch of Lineage has been really cool. So that's why this is actually great timing to be uh, jumping on here and, and chatting about malt, um, obviously specifically Lineage. So uh, excited to take a deep dive into this bottle. Yeah, and I got a lot of questions about it. Uh, as we kind of meander our way into the introduction of this, you'll see Ben is off mic right now. That's because he's not only a participant in this conversation, he's also sort of our de facto producer. So part of his job description is to make sure we're up that you nice people out there see us make sure he gets it out to all the various platforms that need to get it so we can get whiskey talk number five to the peoples the peoples that so desperately need it and uh i think if you've joined us for any of these previous whiskey talks uh and maybe you remember some of the things that we've said about our own preferences when it comes to balcones i know for me it's all led to this because there's a lot of great offerings from our friends in Waco, but the single malt product is far and away my favorite thing that you guys do. And so the idea that we're going to uh, experience the three bottles we're going to experience tonight and then lead up to what you guys are doing with lineage uh, is super exciting for me because I just, I, I just think it's such an incredible thing. So we're going to kind of keep jamming and floating. I think once Ben feels like, we're ready to dive in. Oh, we're getting a thumbs up from Ben. How you doing over there, Benny? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing good. Uh, I'm excited about this. I feel like, um, you know, the pandemic started and we started having these discussions and, you know, we're kind of adapting and evolving and trying to figure out how to thrive and survive in this new world. And then it just kept going and kept going. There's been all sorts of other things happening at, at times. It's felt like the world is absolutely on fire, but, uh, if there's some something comforting. Imagine that. It was bizarre at first to do these Zoom meetings, but there's something comforting about just being able to get back to have a Zoom meeting about whiskey. Yeah, no, that's really well said, dude. And I've, uh, I've been looking forward to this because we've been on a little bit of a, hi a hiatus as far as the Balcones Whiskey Talk crew goes. So uh, as people have filled this thing out, why don't we go back around the horn uh, he was Ben Rogers that was just talking. I'm Jeff Skin Wade. We're the Ben and Skin Show on 97.1 The Eagle in Dallas, Fort Worth. We love that station. We love being there. And it's very, very evident by the interaction that our listeners love Balcones whiskey. And that's part of the reason why we have these uh, whiskey talk extravaganzas. You don't have to listen to The Ben and Skin Show to partake in this and enjoy it, but we certainly think it goes much better with it. And the other two gentlemen you see on your screen, uh, the man with the extra flavory beard is Jared Hempstead. He is sort of, 
he always kind of like pushes, no, nah, no, don't say that. But he is the mastermind behind Balcones in so many different ways. And uh, Jared, we always uh, enjoy talking to you and getting your guidance on these and very excited on a single malt journey that we're going to take tonight. Yep, absolutely. Thanks for having us. Good to see you guys. Absolutely. And the man in the very fashionable <clears> hat <throat> is uh, Alex Elrod, who is kind of an ass kicker. Uh, he appears to be chewing on a roller town can. I don't know what's going on there, but it's supposed but, to be product placement, but it, like the label. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, nice to see you, homeboy. Yeah, it's good to see you guys. It really is it's kind of a, I, this is, these are, I love these. These are awesome. So cheers to you guys. I do too. I feel like uh, we're going to learn a lot. And so where this journey begins is it's safe to say that this is the flagship for you guys, right? And that is, look at that. Texas one. Texas one. Texas single malt. Pretty good stuff right here, boys. Let's crack that open. If you don't have one of these, you need one. I got a couple, and I'm really pleased about that. Is the uh, from uh, in Dodgeball when they have the El Ocho, which is the ESPN eight? Yes. Right? yes. Is there a Uno? Because this would be the Uno, right? Oh, right, right. I think so. Texas one single malt. El Uno. Mal. So, so good. When uh, Ben's brother, Jonathan, first introduced me uh, to the world of Balcones, this is the one that just sort of blew me away. And uh, sorry to sound like a, like a snob, but I was a little apprehensive because I'd had some, let's just say mediocre Texas whiskey experiences. And so... We sat down and it was Ben and Jonathan, Mr. Elrod was there as well. And we're doing some tastings and this is the one I taste where I was like, Oh my God, quit being a snob, open up your ears and your palate and experience the greatness that Texas has to offer. So uh, as we hit the nose and we taste a little bit, why don't you guys, uh, we'll start with you, Jared, tell us about the history of the Texas single ball. The one. Yeah. I mean, um, <clears throat> We started the distillery because we wanted to make single malt. Um, we got a little sidetracked in the early years with some equipment issues and everything we needed to make uh, the corn whiskey line, which ended up being baby blue and true blue and a few other things. We were set up, all the equipment was set up to do that. And we were just repairing a damaged mash tun that we had bought, which we need to, to lauder to do uh, barley based whiskeys the traditional way at least. Um, so we got sidetracked from doing the thing we started out to do, which is this, um, this whiskey. It, it kind of hangs out in a really fun place between uh, traditional single malts, which that would mean until, you know, the last, I don't know, I'm trying to remember when uh, Japanese whiskey single malt production started, but even they kind of fell on, you know, they kind of came on the coattails of the Scottish and Irish traditions. Right. Um, but uh, it's pretty firmly planted, uh, planted in the Scottish tradition all the way up until maturation. So Golden Promise, Promise which is a Scottish barley, very traditional, used uh, 60s through the 80s and kind of has fallen out of favor um, for higher yielding grains, cheaper grains. Um, M1 yeast, very traditional Scotch strain for single malt. Uh, our Forsyth Scottish pot stills, Basically, up until the point when it hits barrel, we're we're basically just kind of following our hero's footsteps. Then that's when we kind of take a turn, and this is either new oak or if it's used oak, it's barely used. Unlike the very depleted, soft, subtle stuff they would be using in Scotland and Ireland, ex bourbon barrels. So the wood profile is intentionally a much more familiar American. If there's parts of this for someone who's a bourbon and rye drinker who thinks, "Oh, I don't like Scotch." This has kind of intentionally got both traditions kind of hanging out, uh, started the way Scotch gets started, finished the way most American whiskey is, is aged and matured. So, And Jared, you're saying that that was intentional to do it, that like you guys set out to sort of have that be the whiskey experience for people? Yeah, I mean, we, we <clears throat> so we're in the States, right? <laughs> we're in Texas, which at the time didn't even have whiskey. And we loved malt but there's there's really no compelling reason to just recreate the entire scotch process here you know that's not 
uh, as a kind of a creative person, that's not the most thrilling idea. Just kind of like mimicking something that someone else has done, but doing it here. Um, and we'll get to other things we've done that are a much harder nod to tradition. Um, but that's not the main reason we exist to just kind of, yeah, man, we're going to do Highland style single malt, right? We're just going to do it here, but we're going to just, we're going to play by the rules. We're going to do everything the way they would do it. Um, which we're doing whiskey in Texas. Like I said, it hadn't been done when we got started. And so there's no such thing as doing it the way it's always been done because this is a, this is a maturation climate that's, uh, unique and has its own challenges and personality that had never, it had never made whiskey before. So, um, that would have been a fool's errand, I think, to try and just uh, copycat your heroes and kind of legends of, you know, global single malt history. Um, so I'm I'm by far the uh, beginner of this squad, uh, and I'm on I'm skiing the uh, the beginner slopes, the bunny slopes. Um, but for me, I I enjoy more whiskey style than Scotch style. Usually, if that makes sense, and some Scotch to me has a real peaty. Uh, it's it's almost like a I don't know how to describe it. It's like a gasoline or, or there's something about it. That's like, okay, that's a little out of my league. Now that's um, a fire. Now that's a fire. Um, there's something about this that I don't know if the right word is approachable, uh, but it, it is approachable. Um, he asked if it's approachable. It is, it is approachable. It is, it is. Uh, but it's, it's, it's almost like, and I've learned a lot. You guys have taught me a lot about um smelling and and the nose and and trying to articulate what you're what you're sensing so i'm already going to fail in that regard but there's some sort of a fruit there's some fruit or something that rounds off the edges it's not hardcore it's just a tiny tiny hint but i think it helps make it smooth and approachable even for me is there any sense to what i'm saying i mean all the words you used are english words so that was I, <laughs> <clears throat> So I understood all of them, every single one of them. What about the order in which he used them? <laughs> yeah, it was fine. <laughs> are there are there fruit yeah, notes in this at all? There's absolutely. Yeah, I mean, once again, I I get a little bit weird. I don't know. I I almost like to defer to Alex or someone else when it comes to those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It you can be kind of leading, and we know what we're going for, and we know what we're kind of intending with this when we do blending. Um, but I also think there's a huge variety over the years of feedback I get. And I, you can get kind of sidetracked if I, if I start with, here's what you should be smelling and tasting. Right. Right. So I, yeah. I usually like to be the last one to go when that, when those yeah. questions come up. Um, what do you think, yeah. Alex? Is there, is there, are there fruit notes in this or? Yeah. I, yeah, I think there's, there's quite a bit of fruit. Uh, I, I tend to, especially with single malt, our single malt, I think the fruit ends up being more of kind of like a, campfire cobbler fruit where it's got uh, a singed kind of um kind of that creme brulee sweetness whereas a lot of times with even unpeated single malts from scotland they'll be lighter and it might be kind of a, a grassier fresh fruit this to me does have fruit quality to it but a lot of like baked bread uh where it, you, you you go towards like the cobbler where it's it's the you you get the the crust and like the the pear apricot, like a singed fruit, almost like you're roasting roasting it a little bit. You get the toasted quality from the barrels, um, but I, I do think it is still very approachable for 53. percent um, And and I think it's it is it is nice and familiar because of the oak profile that you're getting a lot of the residual sweetness without um, some of the medicinal qualities you would get from peated whiskey because. You know, we we make peated whiskey as well, and not everybody enjoys it. Um, I love it. It's good. Yeah. It's good. Uh, it's good. I was actually listening on the radio. I was sitting outside of a Specs. Uh, sorry, well, no free ads, no free ads. But you, <laughs> I heard you telling a story um, on the air, and you had found some at us at another Specs. Yeah. And you scooped up a bunch. The peated is great. It's fun. But is that like uh, is that like the scene in Best in Show where like? You were at one specs. He was at the other specs on the other corner. You were Cross both on your Macs. Street. Yeah. Yeah. We immediately fell in love with each other. Yeah. We were both on our iPhones. We did specs yeah. across the street. <laughs> we like pinged each other or something. And why don't we do this? You just gave us a great idea, Jared. Why don't we enlist Christopher Guest to do one of those style of movies at a at a uh, whiskey tasting or a Scotch tasting? Because if I understand this correctly. This is the one, and I think it was Ben that first told me this. This is the one 
that won the blind taste test award back in the uh, five or six years ago, right? Yeah. How, how, what year was that, Alex? Was that 2012 now? 11? Was it 12, 13? Somewhere in no, there. I think, I, think it was 20, I think it was 2012. It was after Dirk won the championship. That's all we need to know. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> David Robinson had been retired for a while. No, let's not talk uh, about it. That's but, I, but I would imagine that yeah. was, uh, I don't want to say life changing, but certainly that must have been an incredible moment. For you, Jared. It was, it was definitely life changing for, um, for the distillery, for sure. I mean, um, so he's referencing the um, caststrength.net, which no longer exists, but the guys, uh, Joel and Neil, that used to run that website and they would do a blind invitational competition. Um, and they're good. They're good friends of the distillery, but it was the first time they had had a American whiskey in the mix. Mm -hmm. um, it's all blind. So it's all new. Intentionally it's new products, new malts on the market. So ours had just been released. We bottled some at the end of 2011 and started selling it in 2012 and they uh, threw it, threw it in their blind invitational. I pulled up the list every once in a while. You can go find the website. It's called Best in Glass was the competition. And every once in a while, I pulled it up to refresh on who else was in it. But I feel like there was some, even some 20-year-old scotches that were in the mix. Wow. Um, I want to say that Balvenie had something in it. I don't remember. Anyway, there's, we can find the list some other time. But uh, it wasn't something we sent off to. We didn't submit to it because they just picked new products that were on the market that year, did them blind. And uh, one of one of them had actually been pretty critical of American craft whiskey, small barrels, and American single malt in particular. <laughs> so he, when they did the big reveal, he in his little editorial, you know, multiple page little commentary on how the competition went, and when they finally pulled the paper bag off, that he had to eat some of his past words. Um, hmm. But yeah, that was a fourteen month old Texas single malt that uh, it didn't blow up when the competition competition happened, but then Clay Risen who writes a lot about whiskey uh, reported on it. And the New York times ran his article on the competition and the fact that we won it, I think four or five, six months later. Um, and that's actually when it kind of went nuts. The competition wasn't that well known, but when it hit New York times saying, Hey, this guy's from Texas, just um, beat a bunch of Scotch producers on their own soil, you know, in their own territory. Uh, he compared it, he ended up comparing it to the Judgment of Paris, which is the, you know, the famous yeah. American wine and, and blind uh, beating out some French super traditional old world wines. But um, yeah, this is our jam. This is, what we, this is what we started out. This is what we always wanted to make. So this, this is uh, sometimes referred to just with one. You were calling it saying Uno, right? Like just one. Sometimes yeah. you guys just call it one. Yep. The one. Yeah, it's the first. You know, it's our first single malt. Texas first single malt. Our first single malt. So yeah, kind of gave it a little bit of an iconic, but understated. You know, it's just like yeah, it's very black, understated. Yeah, black on black uh, in the background. But yeah, internally we sometimes yeah. Yeah. call it one or put one like in parentheses. Yeah. God, I've been staring at this bottle for a while now, and I just realized there's a one on it. It is understated. I, I love it. I just started hearing people refer to it as one, and it's just the way you've done it is low-key, understated, but very respectful, and uh, it's really awesome. It's really cool. Thanks, man. One. It's fantastic, and it is uh, the jump off of this. Hey, uh, Alex, how long have you been with Balcones? Um... I'm uh, about to hit four years. Okay, so when you got on board, uh, I'm assuming you already knew all about the the Texas single vault. We're probably pretty jacked up to be involved in that. Yeah, that I mean, I think one of the the, the two the two whiskeys that really that I I knew the most about that really drew me in um, outside of you know the handsome devil across the way there <laughs> um, was uh, True Blue One Hundred. Oh no, I was talking about I was talking again about skin here. Yeah, oh, right. Hey, right. Kind of goes up. Ben, ben. Um, I love the i I hear from other people that our screens aren't all the same. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like I'm in the in the position I'm on on my screen on all of y'all's, but I love yeah, when people right. kind of like look to the other guy, Brady Bunch, yeah. Hollywood Squares right. style. 
Peter just broke a vase and we're all trying to cover for him. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm on I'm on top of the skin right now. Hey, sir. Oh. Not that I kind am, of party. Just the way it is. Me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, no, single malt and then true blue one hundred were the ones that really, really drew me in. Um, love the True Blue 100 too. Yeah, so I, I was familiar with, I was most familiar with these whiskeys, and it's probably because they were the hardest to get, um, you know. And so anytime a, a friend, especially friends that live in Waco, you know, would kind of be like, "Hey, dude, look," and then you know, just pull this from the cabinet, and be like, "You want to pour?" Um, so yeah, I, I I was most familiar with the Single Malt and True Blue 100, fantastic whiskeys. Um, I was gonna say too, since we're walking through a few other, we're walking through this malt another expression before we get to lineage. Yeah. Um, even internally, there's a couple of ways to approach tastings and obviously objectively just looking at what's in your glass and trying to describe it, think about it is always the place to start. But since tonight, the one single malt is not going to exist in a vacuum and we are introducing another, a new expression that just came out. Right. Um, I do think it'd be valuable, at least from my perspective to, uh, at least walk through a few of the things that we think are differentiators Okay. that characterize this whiskey as opposed to the other ones that we're going to get to. No, I think that's a great idea. And um, I think there's some, um, obviously there's going to be more wood than the others and wood can exhibit itself in a bunch of ways. People don't think of wood having sugar, but the toasting and charring process does make uh, wood sugars, which are normally not digestible by humans, but are by a lot of animals, uh, into soluble, you know, alcohol and water soluble sugars. So um, when people feel like they get vanilla and caramels and stuff, you absolutely, that's not made up. And that's, that's stuff that's coming from the wood. Um, so there's going to be more of that. It's definitely more tannic, which I, we've probably talked about tannin on other episodes. I'm not sure, but my mm-hmm. favorite way to describe it for people who aren't familiar with the term or people that only understand it from wine terms. Um, The easiest thing for a Southerner to know, understand is when you oversteep black tea, you're making tea, you're making sweet tea and you just let it go too long. And it's, there's that drying feeling. Um, It's a feeling almost as much as there's a taste, Um, but that's a wood, that's a wood extractive. Um, So it's much more heavy in American whiskeys in general. Anytime you've got new oak, you're just going to have a higher, higher, Wood sugar and tannin both are going to be more present. It's a little spicier. Um, but just this last week, because me and Gabe have been working on, we just finished Lineage. Ironically, we're about to have to blend it again before long. We just ended up working on uh, a small distillery only High Plains, all Texas barley release for later this, this summer. Cool. And and we're working on single malt. Or we just finished single malt, one single malt. And so the differences are kind of painfully on our mind because a lot of it's the same stock and based on what you smell and taste the barrel doing as it is progressing, they kind of get channeled, you know? Uh, so yeah, the, the, thing, the thing that kept popping up this time was kind of this varnish, mm-hmm. uh, leather, old furniture, maybe oiled glove kind of, there's l- maybe leather, there's maybe tobacco, there's maybe wood. And then whether it's mink oil or whether it's maybe even some sort of, dusting polishing thing that might have some citrus or like eucalyptus kind of notes to it just that vibe uh that we feel like is unique to this and it was kind of more obvious this last time around because we've been blending a bunch of different malt expressions kind of in a tight timeline and it was like man even pulling out references i don't know that it had been on our mind if we just look what's in the it's what's in the glass but doing side by with a bunch of other stuff usually it's fruit and all this other stuff that pops into our head um but varnish, we kept talking about varnish over and over and over. Shout out to the great Jim Varnish, who was so good in Ernest Goes to Camp. Wonderful. It's <laughs> not that good, actually. It's not that good. Um, <laughs> <at> best. <laughs> All right. So I have some questions also about the history of single malt, but I want to save it more towards the end, if you guys don't mind. Because I think ma- uh, now might be a good time to pivot and boogie on to Mirador, ladies and gentlemen. Mirador. Alex, do you know the, uh, do you know why this is called Mirador? What is the story on that? Um, Mirador, it's kind of a, I don't know. I'm just gonna keep up holding up random things. I feel like. 
Yeah, that, that <laughs> I have a pen. I hold up my tape dispenser earlier. Means yeah. a whale's vagina. Oh, okay. I'd forgotten about that. He's right. Uh, I believe. Uh, he says it very authoritatively. Who said that? Wrong. It's uh, it, is it, you, you wouldn't. Would you say it's a play on words, Jed? Uh, kind no, of. Uh, maybe a little bit. It's. I have. I've got a couple of uh, documents saved with um, kind of brainstorm stuff around the branding and expression ideas. Um, and every once in a while when we're struggling to name something new, I go back to that and just kind of mull over some things and see if something jives with what's in the bottle, if it relates in any way to some of the cool names that we'd like to use over the years. Um, the easiest way to say Mirador is a synonym for Balcones. So hmm. Balcones is a Spanish word for balcony, uh, which has everything to do with the fault line here and the two sides that there's a lot, I mean, the, the, even the hill country is the west side of the Balcones escarpment. Here in Waco, we have these big limestone cliffs by the river that when you're on one side, it looks like you feel like you're on a balcony looking down on the other side of the river. Um, a mirador is a little bit more like kind of like a parapet or like a lookout. Um, but it's still like a, you know, those little like kind of teardrop shaped on the side of like a castle wall or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And someone might poke their head out. You're pretty well protected, but you can see what's going on. Um, so we knew this was a pretty radically different direction from what our regular flagship is about. Um, and so we used a synonym for the brand name, but at the same time, it was kind of an idea of, you know, we were, shoot, we were, I guess we were 10 years in, is that right? Because 18, yeah, we were 20, we were 10 years in, we did a, an expression that was much more overtly a nod to our heroes in the old world. Um, but the idea of a vantage point, the idea of taking stock after a decade, um, let, viewing the landscape, kind of trying to back off and get the big picture. Oh, yeah. um, and so all of that was kind of in our heads of this is a radical or different direction. And in some ways, just an homage to some of the malts we fell in love with when we fell in love with whiskey and decided to make whiskey ourselves. Um, and we kind of didn't mind. We were hoping maybe some people would try it and not even be able to recognize that we did it. Um, it's such a radical shift. But um, we didn't want to imitate when we started, but there is something about trying to uh, work in the same space or the same direction maybe as uh, your heroes and see what you're made of, I guess. Um, but yeah, so this is very much inspired by Space Side. This is all refill, same same liquid. I'm gonna first time I'm gonna hold up a real thing instead of being silly. Nice. This is you know, it's very light. Yeah, it may not even show up, but I mean, this is not even half as dark. Yeah, as the, as the one. Um, so this and has why no, is that? This has no you no new barrels in it. This is all ex bourbon or ex other barrels of ours from some of our other whiskeys. So this is very much how scotch gets made. Um, it's a little bit older. This is three years old. Um, takes a little bit longer for things to kind of round out when you don't have just all this intense wood influence um, or when the whiskey's not about that. Some of the subtleties um, have to just be even more like in their place and kind of like resolved. Um, I've always used the example of uh, Pilsners are like this. I think cooking eggs is like this. You know, there's no, you're not hiding. You fry an egg and someone wants it over easy, medium, hard. Like you, you mess that up. There's no, there's no cover up for that. Uh, the Ramones are like my favorite musical example. It's like, no, there's like nothing going on here. They need to be on time. The guitar tone needs to be dope. If he goes to a palm mute, he better nail it because there's nothing else happening here, you know? Um, so that's kind of what these delicate, lighter, fruitier, softer malts have to kind of be about from the blending perspective. I'd love to know, Alex, uh, for you to walk us through your nose on this. Just what are you, what are you smelling in this? I, Mirador, I, I really enjoy because of 
really the really the experiment that we're walking through together here the juxtaposition between um texas one single malt that has so much more of that toasted um you know it's it's a it's a balance between the oak profile and the grain whereas then mirador is is that radically different profile uh much softer um i think the fruit quality that we were talking about earlier is still there but it, it goes into much more of a brighter, fresher, juicy, fresh fruit versus that kind of that, that singed cobbler quality. Um, so I, I think this is, it, it's, it's really fantastic to, to try these side by side because they're the same barley and, and more or less the same barrels for, for the most part, um, same warehouse. Like there's, there's no trickery or, or you know, magic necessarily. And so this is, it's more or less an experiment of, um, the subtlety of oak and really what it can do. And of course, then there's a lot of mastery behind what, you know, Jared and Gabe and, you know, originally Zach were doing with blending in order to bring out some more of the honey, um, some of the kind of waxier comb, like honey comb is what I mean by waxy comb quality to where, um, and yes, comb, C-O-M-B, comb, honey yeah. comb. Yeah. Um, I'm making cereal right now, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's... Um, but at, I'm drinking, I'm actually drinking this year's bottling. We, we didn't, we didn't discuss that. Jared, are you drinking this year's? Yeah, I'm drinking this okay, year's. Yeah. 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 Um, so this is, uh, this is a 56%. So Texas one was 53. We're jumping up a, a few notches to 56%. Um, and then we'll kind of softly land with lineage at 47%. Um, but I still think this is very, very approachable. Um, much more fruity, way less, you know, way less of that tannic quality that we were discussing earlier. So it still has a nice, really lingering oily quality on it. Um, it's originally, I, I when, when this first came out a couple of years ago, I said that this was our most crushable whiskey um, <laughs> because, because it's so light and refreshing and delicate and something altogether, not Balcones, if you will. And so it's interesting to see how this is done in the market over the last few years, because people, um, you know, like Jared said, it, it's interesting to see how folks, um react to it out in the wild because it's it's so unlike balconies like how in the hell could they do that um so it's it's a fun conversation piece to see something that light um i mean you can you can see you can basically see luca staring into my soul through that bottle next <laughs> i mean that's that's like most balconies whiskeys so, is he old right. enough to look at, is he an old enough to look through a whiskey bottle he is now. <laughs> not when he got here but he is now so. okay phew Wow, I didn't. I didn't I was wondering if it was like a age statement for rookie of the year, but I guess not. You can be a teenager, right? Is that? I think so. Yeah. It, it's, is uh, as we kind of discuss all this, the end result of what you're talking about is that because all the barrels are used, is that the the basic uh, distinction there, and that's why that ends up like that? Yeah, yeah. It just has a lot less uh, new oak influence. Um, yeah, it's also a, bl a blending nightmare. The the barrels we looked at, um, just shy of about three hundred barrels, I think. Usually, if we were to pull, I don't know. This is a term that internally we use, but like we talk about the usage rate. If we know we need to, they need a blend of single malt that's going to be I don't know, eighty barrels or something, right? We know we need to pull at least three to four times that much to get that volume because that's how much is going to get rejected or not going to work or not be ready. Um, this, do you remember how big this bottling was, Alex? I want to say it ended up being like 17 barrels or 15 barrels. And we looked at like 275. Yeah, it was like the, the gap was massive. It yeah. was a, it was a nightmare. So yeah, we didn't even have 10%. We had like 6% usage or something that just doesn't, the barrels that make this specific kind of that, that beeswax, all of that delicate fruit. That's not, overripe or bruised or caramelized or like holiday spices, but just like bananas and marmalades and the floral stuff too. Some of that honeysuckle and just these, they're delicate, they're delicate things. Um, there's just not that many of them. So to make more, we have to make a lot more just so I can continue to find 6% or whatever to make that goes into this. Um, and, and some, some brands go hardcore with the barrel charring like they go hardcore and you guys i'm told do like a light toasting of the barrels which uh 
can lead to more flavor. Is that accurate? Toasting and charring are different. We usually people talk about the char, which is the burnt part. It's literally the black part. Um, what you mostly see on marketing materials. You mostly hear people talking about how charred it is, but char is actually activated carbon. So scientifically the char doesn't even give you anything. It actually cleans things out. You know, you can use activated carbon to make tr some Creek water drinkable, right? They use it in vodka to make it colorless. Um, so what they really, when they're talking about the char being really heavy, what they really are excited about is the fact that if you, if you light that inside of that barrel on fire and let it go for a little bit, you end up with caramelized uh, wood sugar components right behind it. And that's actually technically the toast. So you're kind of right. We don't do heavy charring. We do do heavy toasting. So we'll do a lower, a lower temp, non, not on fire treatment of the inside of our barrels for a long time. So you get this, they call it the red zone or the heat affected zone. If we were to cut a stave in half uh, on a normal bourbon barrel, there's a pretty thin layer. It's like black and then there's a little bit of brown and then it's just oak. And ours are brown and red almost halfway to the, through the stave, um, which means that there's just that much more wood stuff available to be sucked in and dissolved into the into the, the whiskey um, usually heavy toasting is a bad term with whiskey because it means the guy's been drinking too much before he <laughs> hands the mic yeah. right heavy toasting too much toasting yeah oh, but or I, you know in the ska scene the toaster he's your, oh he's yeah your, he's your hype man rude you boy's know. gonna get ragamuffin up in here i love that you guys use an nba analytic inside the walls of balcones when you talk about usage rate Oh. <laughs> this guy has a high usage rate. Things go really well for the Mavericks. That absolutely yeah. makes me happy. Who has the highest right now going into the restart? Which, by the way, we're we are doing this instead of watching games right now. What That's the, okay. We can. I, we'll, it's the beauty. Yeah. We'll be able to get all caught up. Lakers Clippers are later. I think we're missing Pels right now. We'll, we'll, yeah, Pels we're jazz missing. Or, yeah, Jazz. Yeah. Lakers Clippers will be. We'll do heavy toasting for Lakers Clippers yeah. later. And then we'll get we'll get our Mav on a little bit later. Um, okay, so uh, th this is Mirador is really really nice. This is a great great expression and highly highly recommended. Are you, I, for, I forgot another dynamic that. Um, so we'll talk about this when we get to lineage also. But part of what, what other another dynamic that went into Mirador was we make a lot of bruisers, right? We make a lot of even if they're even if they're approachable, as Ben was saying. Uh, they, these are higher proof. We intentionally try to pack as much flavor into the smallest space possible. So they're, they're intense, even when they're not, even if they're not burned, you know, even if they're not aggressive, there's a lot going on. Um, and so we find ourselves drinking very different. We, we, we end up drinking personally for fun with a lot of contrast. Um, so that's, that was another inspiration behind this was, and just like lineage, which we're going to get to when you find yourself trying to drink things that are maybe not uh, what you currently have stuff like that in your lineup. And you're like, well, why, why don't we make something like that that fits that bill as well? Um, and also I think we used to get kind of uh, painted into a corner as far as what all of our whiskeys are like this, 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 or this is what they know how to do. Um, and I just remember that right now that Mirador was a little bit of a, of uh you know we'll show you you think you've got us figured out what we can't what we're capable of or the kind of whiskeys we make um yeah i'd forgotten that that was kind of a dynamic but can't you gotta throw the gauntlet down you know i think uh i think ben has referenced this on whiskey talk before but he likes to call that the crazy ivan the crazy ivan yes explain yeah. the crazy ivan ben the crazy ivan and the uh, did you ever see the movie the hunt for red october and so you've got this uh, a submarine with another submarine directly behind it and they can't make any noise and they've got to be right on each other's tail. And um, the submarine in front has no idea if the submarine is really behind it. So every once in a while, you know, cause it's going to turn left and everyone knows, Oh, they always turn left. I'm going to turn left. I'm there. They always turn right, right here. They turn right. And if they're predictable, they never can see if there's a submarine behind them. So every once in a while, the submarine commander, Ivan, would do a crazy Ivan and he would break his pattern and do something entirely unpredictable just to throw everybody off, just to show you cannot predict me. And so that's yeah. the crazy Ivan. Crazy Ivan. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, I think if I'm, if you guys are ready, I'm ready to move on to the lineage. Yep. But before I do it, I think it's a bad idea for Alex to have the backdrop he does. Because my understanding is that people will kill you to get their hands on the Bach. I see the Bach behind <laughs> me right now. And it's so hard to get your hands on. You might get jacked. That's kind of like uh, posting a video where you're walking around with a wad of cash or something. That's yeah, a, yeah. That's a bad idea. Are you guys ready for the lineage? I'm very yeah. excited about yep. this. Okay. Um, let's show them the bottle, gentlemen. Done some damage on mine. Uh, oh. No, that's the wrong one, Alex. <laughs> Alex is fine. Alex, uh, while we're looking at this bottle and yep. we're about to, uh, you know, pour and smell here, get it, yep. show it with the logo there on the on lineage. What does that mean? What does that uh, embody? Oh, I'm at, Jared should should walk us through this because this is I don't know if this it's important. I feel like we don't we started to do it a lot recently, um, but you can kind of and I guess you can kind of see it behind me when you look at kind of the spectrum of what we've released. But there's a bit of a pattern when you look at, you know, all of our core products will have a black wax seal um, and then special special releases. So Mirador, which we've, we've spoken about. And um, single barrels will have a gold wax seal. Um, Texas One Single Malt, to denote that it's our flagship, has a red wax seal. Uh, and then if you if you if you look here, you pointed it out. Skin yep. um, Bach has a red wax seal, and Lineage does now as well. Um, so I think you can, you can start seeing a little bit of a pattern. Um, I mean, I think maybe Bach aesthetically mat it just matches the Shiner um Schenerbach uh, uh colors quite right. quite nicely, but yeah. which is, really, is iconic yeah very yeah. iconic but this is this is really neat because I think for for us to release a new malt um whiskey especially something that's going to fall into the year-round category for us to have it you know have the same features uh, or very similar features um and not have a black wax seal but have a red wax seal to me should should maybe should maybe cause something to happen with people's eyes and brains to say that like, look, we, we, we view this as, as just as special, um, albeit it's slightly different, um, to, to view it as something very special. And then um, I, Jared, Jared should definitely walk us through what this label looks like. Cause I, I, as you can see, it's, it's quite a bit different than um, some of our other, our other expressions. Mm -hmm. um, so to have this symbol here is, is pretty unique. And um, I think it's important to, to walk us through the, what the symbol is because it's really beautiful to see. Yeah. I have a f uh, an affinity for pretty vague, uh, abstracted symbols. Some of them, you know, there's, there's old alchemical stuff. I don't know if you've ever seen any, some of those old alchemy shorthand symbols that they would use for things, for air, salt, you know, earth. Um, same with like uh there's like all the hobo signs too you know it's like friendly house or mm -hmm. don't stay here mm -hmm. or people will let you shower and give you a meal whatever or mean dog all that kind of stuff and there's like little hash marks little code that, that the train hoppers would use and then i mean native american stuff too so all that's kind of floating around and same thing sometimes they have their own meaning sometimes you visually like them right but when you visually like one and it has some significance wherever it comes from, and then that fits with the concept or vision behind something you're doing, or you can kind of, it starts gelling. So at a very, at its most simple, that is a very abstract, simplified rising sun. So we have a horizon line and the sun's coming up. Part of it's still obscured, part yeah. of it's showing. Um, but the idea of kind of, progeny uh the next phase the next generation right uh, a new a new day all of that was kind of floating around in our heads and um yeah it was actually jerry Jonathan. you made me think of a really interesting well, i yeah. don't know it's interesting to me at least with the idea of the horizon line because you guys are merging east and west the sun rises yeah. in the east and it sets in the west when you were kind of laying that all out right there that's what it made me think of yeah i hadn't even thought about that aspect of it but yeah that's cool that makes a lot of sense that's coming from yeah or is that is that is that rising or is it setting it could be either right it so. could be either because that's sort of 
I don't want to put words into the mouths or I don't want to mis mislead, but there is very much the word lineage and what it means in regards to this. I think when we look at the fact that we talked earlier about you guys winning the blind taste test in 2014 over in Scotland and then the old world ways and then the new, I mean, we could talk old world, new world all day long. Right. right, right. But specifically <laughs> we're talking about single malt and the tradition of that and the lineage of that. And one of the things that you have to talk about when you talk about this uh, is, you know, and, and Ben has pointed this out to me on the pot still bourbon is the price point being something that's very accessible while also being rich and having a little bit of depth to it, which is, I think, kind of the magic of what you guys have captured here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Starting once again with our drinking habits. So me and Gabe have been talking for a while about wishing we had a lower proof malt as much as I would love for people to understand that, especially with single malt water, it should be a part of your service and your experience yeah. yeah or unless unless you're already doing rocks and then you're getting some natural dilution as it you know melts i um, wish i was cracking these as we were drinking it i just don't have tap water here in my uh oh right yeah yeah um so you know wanting something lighter both in profile and in abv because we find ourselves even if i drink our regular single malt we blend cast strength whiskey all the time and i find myself going to I find myself more drawn to what rocks. Plus it doesn't help that it's like a hundred and something in Texas for the next 50 days. Right. right. Um, I don't usually do rocks, but right now it's like, man, I can do rocks or I can do a highball or something. Um, so we find ourselves going to these lighter and diluting even things that are 47, 46, 43. I still find myself putting cold, you know, some cool water in them this time of year. So we've been talking about doing something lighter. Um, and once again, all of that spice, all that wood varnish leather stuff that happens in the one, what 106 proof, there's all these reasons why it's beloved, but there's also the, some of those same reasons are like, man, I don't, you don't want all that all the time, maybe. And if you're not some collector, uh, this is like a hobby for you. You're just kind of someone who likes a whiskey every once in a while. That can be a little bit much, right? Um, yeah. so both because we wanted to drink something slightly lighter and also to try and address some of the ways that um, we, it's really easy for us to get caught up in how we experience and live the whiskey world. Right. Um, but we're not even a percent of the whiskey drinkers. I mean, it's we have a very specific relationship to whiskey, the making of it, the drinking of it. And to, um, uh, we were kind of, yeah, I don't know. There's an aspect of meeting people somewhere in between this, like you're submerged, you're, you're neck deep in whiskey world and there's 500 bottles open behind you and you buy three, $400 bottles and you don't blink and you know, just all oh, cast strengths better and super old or super young. Like I don't care, whatever, um, to, to realize that there's regular folks that both don't spend the kind of money that most small producer craft whiskey costs. Right. So that was part of our conversation to address that barrier. Um, and then some of the profile things about our, our original malt that are, they're kind of meant for a little bit more seasoned whiskey drinker. Uh, and can we make something that's a little bit easier to walk into if this is your first, uh, first round with us? Um, it, it's been frustrating over the years. It's, it's expensive to do a startup small thing compared to the, the, the scale the big guys get to work at. You guys know this um, in some of your endeavors too. You, you pick better ingredients. You will do it the hard way. Um, you're not buying stuff by like thousand acres of grain at a time. Right. You don't own your own farmers, blah, blah, blah. Um, but still no one ever set out to make stuff that's just like inaccessible uh, both in flavor and price to just regular folks. And over the years, um, you know, I, I might have family members that buy a bottle or two a year. That's like a splurge, you know, and they're trying to be nice. And they want to be respectful and they want to, you know, spend some time with this thing that we make because they love you. And they're just not the kind of people that go around, you know, they think 30 bucks is an expensive bottle of whiskey. And we all know people like that. Yeah. Um, so we're still not even there, but it is a single malt. It's a little bit older. Um, but we really wanted to make it uh, reasonable. Um, 
to see is, see how many people we can engage in the conversation that is ongoing with what we're trying to do at Balconies, but also in the bigger picture of kind of the growing and emerging uh, movement that American single malt is. And none of it's super, none of it's cheap. Uh, none of it's particularly affordable. Nobody would accuse most American single malts of being super affordable, even ours. And so we kind of went out of our way. Let's make something that's pretty approachable, familiar, easy, but not dumb. You, if you can break it, you can break it down if you want to, but you should also be able to just have it be a companion to a hangout, to a game, to a dinner, and have it not be the centerpiece and to be demanding like, hey, I'm over here, I'm this big, bold, loud whiskey. Hey, pay attention to me. Um, yeah, and be affordable and try and hopefully broaden that circle of people that are a part of this conversation and a part of this movement and this energy that the American single malt's having right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by that because we we did an exercise with this when, when we first were exposed to it and we had uh, some other little samples uh, of bottles that were marked that we didn't know what they were, uh, but they were all the top end, uh, you know, the top of class, most expensive, you know, bottles you can think of. And we're going back and forth and trying different things. And it was this hung with it in every way. And so you do, you would have some, I'm just thinking out loud here, but you would have some business people that would say, okay, uh, yeah, you've created a, something that is in the upper echelon top shelf. Now let's price it. All right, 80 bucks a bottle or 60 bucks a bottle or, you know, but this is less than 40 bucks a bottle. And, and Alex, I'm just wondering for you, uh, what do you make of this? Are you excited that something so good can be so accessible and that it's priced the way it is? Yeah, this is, I mean, I, th I think this is, there's a, there's something beyond just the new release. I think there's something pretty, pretty cool happening here with this. Um, yeah, because the suggested retail is around $39.99. Um, so I, I think this, this opens up the world of American single malt for a lot of folks that before have always said, um, like Jared mentioned, oh, American whiskey, it's too expensive, whatever, craft whiskey, so expensive, it sucks. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're doing. But this is a, a considerably older whiskey than what we would normally um, see, from, especially from Balconies being three, three years um, and, you know, a, a blend of both uh, Texas and Scottish barley. So there is a, you know, part of that lineage being part of our, our, our roots and our heritage being Texas grown barley. Um, but at a price point and a proof that a lot of folks that would normally always be staunchly against American whiskey, but then maybe even American single malt could, could jump into it. And it, this is a launching platform for even other American single malts that we, we love and enjoy and have spent time and, and broken bread with. So I think this is fantastic. I'm excited. Um, we just launched it last week and it's kind of exploded for us. Um, you know, as far as like popularity and just, uh, rel you know, relatively amazing reviews from the, um, average consumer to the, you know, uh, whiskey enthusiast that is a, a huge Balcones fan. Um, everybody's kind of just high-fiving us, um, which is, is always very encouraging. Um, and so for us to be able to, to kind of come out with something that isn't just a drop in the bucket for us, but can can hit the Texas market. And then, you know, for us later in the year, launch it to a handful of other States. I think this, this had really, we're onto something. Um, and I, I don't know how often Jared and Gabe and team really like to look at it like that, but internally the sales team is incredibly inspired. Um, I know the marketing arm of things is, is very inspired by this product and uh, we're, we're excited to see what this will do in competition as well. Right. Um, not really competition season right now. And so a lot of the competitions usually have a lot of really big festivals connected with them. So we won't be going to, you know, whiskeys of the world. We don't know what icons of whiskey are really going to do this year. Um, Wizards of whiskey. Uh, we don't know, but we will enter this into it because we're, we're pretty proud of it. I, I mean, I think it's, I love this whiskey already. Yeah. So talking about being something being crushable, this is crushable. Yes. Um, and something you can drink in the heat or in, in a little bit of a cooler atmosphere. Um, I don't know. This is exciting to, to, to see hit the market uh, and, and how folks are embracing it already. So I, I, I really couldn't believe it when I first tried it. Um, I was super blown away by it. 
And, you know, we talk about, uh, we've been talking about the name and the symbolism and all that, but there is something really interesting that not only is it Scottish malted barley and Texas barley, but it's also new barrels and, uh, you know, used barrels, old barrels as well. And so yeah. I'm curious, Jared, how you find the right mix on that or what the strategy was on that as you started going into this process. Yeah, the like I was talking about earlier, the the flagship malt being picking components of both traditions to kind of fuse. Mm -hmm. um, and with this one, it really was just kind of just taking that one step or a couple steps further. So we got barley both from Texas and from Scotland. Um, and both both grains, we age in new and used barrels. So that's really all four of that, you know, yeah. Texas barley in new Oak, golden promise, Scottish barley in new Oak, Texas barley in refill and Scottish barley in refill. And all of that was on the table and the proportion will probably change. Um, Cause we'll be shooting for a profile, not a recipe. That's like, here's how many percentage, here's the breakdown of what of those four components make it. Um, but yeah, that's, um, it'll be fun to see even going forward what we've got and what's available and what's mature and ready to use and watching, watching those proportions kind of fluctuate like they already do in the regular one. That's, that is mostly new Oak, but there's American, there's uh, Hungarian and French and those proportions vary all the time. And there may be 20% of one blend that's French and the next time you might not use any. So um, just depends on the life cycle of where, where the barrels are and what they've got to offer. Um, so, yeah. And I know if, between time and some other stuff we want to do, so in a sense, <clears throat> the lineage is the child or the next generation of that starts with the patriarch here with the one uh, Mirador, which is the same Scottish barley, but all refill barrels, very light, fruity kind of nod to space side. And then we did last year our first release of the Texas grown and malted barley that we've laid down over the years. Um, this year is also going to be a distillery only, but next year it'll hit. Uh, so this is this year's bottling that'll be coming into the distillery here in a few weeks. Um, Ooh, that's an exclusive look. There you go. Yeah, it's so good. It's, can I, since you just called the one the patriarch, can I call the Mirador the matriarch? Are we okay sure. with that? Or? That's Ooh. absolutely. Ooh, we, like can, that. we can have no arcs. Um, you know, we can just have an anarchist commune and nobody needs to be in charge. That'd be cool. <laughs> or um, Noah's Ark. <laughs> Noah's Ark. Hey, um, I, I, I am curious, uh, the Texas Bach, uh, the way consumers have reacted to it, it's, it is like, hey, oh my God, you got to find it. You better find some of that. Well, lineage already is a little bit like that. I mean, the consumer response has been off the charts. Do, do people need to rush out and grab it off the shelves before they can't get it? Because um, I know that uh, the demand is massive already. I mean, I don't think so. We're like I said, we just bottled the first blend. The first round might go fast, but I'm, I'm about to bottle a bunch more. And uh, I think we have even a third bottling before the end of the year's out. So um, there'll be thousands to, over, you know, couples, couple of thousands of bottles of this available. So I, I don't, I don't know if it's going to be enough, brother. So you, maybe not, <laughs> keep, maybe not. Keep, keep anyway, making you know, it. You know, hey, they, don't, they don't Hopefully listen we'll... to me. They don't listen to me, but tell them to listen to me and just make more Bach next time too. Because I've not met anyone <laughs> blown away by the Bach. The Bach is yeah, that we didn't amazing. lay down enough of that for sure. We have more coming, but uh, it's awesome. I mean, I, I don't period. know that you guys. I mean, we're fanboys, uh, so we certainly uh, kneel at the altar of Balcones. You guys don't make missteps, man. And well, thanks, certainly, thanks. Bill on all. Great. Congratulations. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. Really Thanks, awesome. man. Yeah. Appreciate it. Congratulations. Okay. We got to wrap up with uh, something that we did on the Ben and Skin show. Uh, our KT came up with this and it's the KT music challenge. And we sent you guys the list and you guys can start going through some of this. And maybe we'll get into more <laughs> in, the, in the next time. It's, it's, it's quite extensive, but I want to ask you Ooh. this just on the spot. I want you guys to give us a tough one. who has your favorite female voice as a singer and favorite male voice as a singer. It doesn't have to be your favorite female or male singer. It might just be that they have the most distinctive voice or something you really enjoy. It's your personal favorite female voice and your personal favorite 
male voice, any genre? Uh, Stevie Nicks. Hell yeah. So distinctive. So distinctive. Yeah. Which, yeah, dude, a, a, speaking yeah. of local, Post Malone has, I, re, I think, over the last year, I think, has, or maybe a yeah, couple that's, years. That's a male, that's a male vocal. <laughs> right. Alex. You're right, Alex. Hold on. Yeah. I got to tease it out. Post Malone has said that a little bit of the slight vibrato that he does in some of his, like, singing stuff is because of his love for Stevie Nicks, so... Well, hold on. Let me let me keep that local as well because Don Henley lives in the DFW, and my entry point into Stevie Nicks because of the age. It's not like I grew up as a seven year old going, "Oh, I love Fleetwood Mac." Now, the duet that she did with Don Henley, "Leather and Lace," was my first real Stevie Nicks memory of a song where, like, I really and also she did "Stop Dragging My Heart Around" with Tom Petty, but that that's. My sort of intro because of the age I'm at, that's my entry point to Stevie Nicks. So I'm going to go ahead and tie it back to DFW with the Don Henley reference. Just for you, Alex. Yeah. Yeah. How many steps removed from DFW? You know that game? Yeah. Uh, this was a tough one. In my brain, I started racking my brain real quick over some of my favorite female singers, but the way you said it was weird, where it's like it doesn't have to be your favorite singer. Favorite voice. It's favorite voice. Spoken word. But not, but not best because it still has to be your favorite. Your favorite. That's not. Yeah, you don't have to plant is. a flag and make a statement that this is the greatest female singer. You just are saying it's your personal favorite voice of a female. This singer. is like the this is like the debate in sports when you start debating what does the MVP mean, right? Well, don't debate what it means. You've got right or thing. yeah, could championship Heat beat the you know eighty six Lakers? I mean, whatever. They're all like, badass. Uh, They're all. Know. Know. But the rules are different. Like we didn't have, well, right. yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think after racking my brain while you letting you guys talk, I'm gonna go with Linda Ronstadt. Oh, really, man? That's that's uh, so that's what, so my, that's what my that's dad good. used to bump when I was growing up. That sort of, uh, you know, I just mentioned Don Henley, but that sort of country rock blend of all yeah. that linda ronstadt was getting bumped in my household when i was okay. uh, you know, yeah i'm thinking uh, so you're no good you're no good you're yeah. no good you know yeah hell yeah but i was thinking uh i almost made a couple of pit stops off before picking that dolly dolly gets played in our house a lot my wife puts dolly on a lot yeah which then That's my it. brain i love him Lemmy lou harris Ooh. but she's got a very specific i wouldn't say that's the best voice but she's one of my favorite singers Patsy and then of Klein. course, Patsy Klein. Sure, I was I was right on the edge of just taking a leap before Linda Ronstadt popped back in my head from like all the roller skate, skate you know album covers and stuff from my parents. Yeah. I was about to just go straight up with Whitney because that's a pretty solid. Oh uh, yeah, that's a pretty maybe solid. the goat. Did you guys see a coal miner's daughter when y'all were young. Hmm. Sissy Spacek. I know the song, but no, I don't know. I haven't seen it. The movie. Good movie. All right. Out. So, what about uh, in, in uh, skin? You went with uh, Aretha Franklin, right? I went with Aretha Franklin, Oof. and the best the best uh, thing I could ever say about her voice is actually kind of a hokey song. It's a corny song, but the second her voice comes in in the Burt Bacharach tune "Say a Little Prayer," it gives me chills. Like it, that the timber of her voice gives me chills. But if I was going to have someone listen to an Aretha Franklin song, I was going to say, here's the one song you listen to. Um, it never loved a man, uh, which is an incredible story behind it. The story will give you chills, how that came together in the segregated South where her and her husband manager went down to record at Muscle Shoals and they didn't realize it was a all white musicians and, there was all this racial tension in the room and it just starts with a simple electric piano riff and the rest is history. But uh, her voice is just, it's, it's just everything for me. It's so, so good, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that song is on your pl uh, playlist, Chili Chill Master Source. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Which I, you guys should check that out on Spotify. Chili <laughs> Chill, Chili Chill Master Source. Skin's got like 12 hours of just chill music and it's unfreaking believable. Uh, I'm embarrassed because you guys have such depth to your answers 
but there's there's one female voice that just I it just is as good as any female voice I, I've ever heard, and it's a young new pop star, so it's cheesy. Wait. But it's Hal Halsey. I love Halsey. Ooh, I don't know if you guys are, their voice is dope, dude. She's got such a cool voice, man. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of. Just, okay, so so what about male voices? What is your favorite? And skin, who did you go with on this? So uh, this is really really difficult because you know all the music we consume and how it makes us feel. But I went with Marvin Gaye, and part of the reason I went with him is because of his overall vision of how the voice should be used. I mean, it's got a great quality to it, but you know, he, the way he stacks his background vocals, the way he does his ad libs and the way it all comes together is just, I mean, you know, he's the first soul artist that I did a deep dive on. I was probably 18 or 19 years old, but I love, love, love the sound of Marvin Gaye's voice. It's really and cool. I I'll buy you guys some more time to keep thinking about this since we blindsided you with it. But we, I went with Sturgill Simpson. I just Ooh, fucking beast. I, it's nice. just his uh, voice is so deep. It's uh, just a, when he. There's no question when he's singing that it's him. You're like, damn. Okay, Sturgill singing. Have um, you been? Have you ever heard of uh, Coulter Wall? No, dude. Yeah, I get Coulter, give so Coulter Wall, Canadian dude, young I'm guy. In. If you guys Solid. recommend it, I'm in. Yeah, his he sounds he's he's maybe one forty soaking wet, and he's not even thirty. And when you hear his last couple of records, you'd swear I don't know if he just smokes constantly or what, but he's got the deepest. I mean, like yes. sub Johnny Cash, like lower than that sound. So this oh, is not okay. deep. This is high. But when you said one forty soaking wet, I love the lead singer Band of Horses. I mean, that guy probably weighs seven pounds, and I love his voice. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, you know. Okay. Who wants to go first of you guys? Favorite male voice? Man, Alex, are you still struggling? Are you ready? Oh, I, I just, I, I feel like I'm just going to say Otis Redding. Oh, I don't hell know. yeah, dude. Yes. Perfect blend of grit and yeah. finesse. You'll never find a better blend Whoa. of grit and finesse. And just, there's, there's never a wrong time. It's always good. He's incredible. Uh, that's, that's crazy. The yeah, season. That, that's crazy because I was about to say I've got a tie between Otis and Chris Cornell. Oh, my God. oh, oh hell Cornell. yeah. We talked about that on the air. Yes, God, yes. Chris Cornell makes me cry just thinking about him singing, man. Good yeah, luck. He's so good. Have you, Jared, have, we've never, the isolated vocals of Black Hole Sun? Oh, I've never, is it on, is it like, on, it's like on, on YouTube. There's okay, like, I've, I've never listened to it. Like isolated vocals of Black Hole Sun. It, yes, like, Stone Temple Pilots, uh, Soundgarden, right? I mean, yeah, no, Soundgarden. He was in Soundgarden. He wasn't yeah. in Stone yeah, Temple. Yeah, but, yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about that whole same era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And actually, uh, you mentioned Stone Temple Pilots. Scott Whelan's Wyland Whelan. He's sometimes he tried to channel David Bowie, but we're talking about two guys that left the Earth way too soon. Yeah. Uh, and I know Stone Temple Pilots look at certain ways, but they're that guy's a great vocalist. I think they're an interesting band. Tiny Vatican music is an exceptional album. It is not a grunge album at all. It's exceptional. Um, but you, you mentioning Chris Cornell made me think of two things. You know, we have a tendency to take the life parts and attach it to music after the fact and all that. But knowing that Chris Cornell did end up taking his life because he struggled with things, you go back and you listen to uh, Black Days and the way that he goes from this slight grumble to this soaring powerful thing and knowing what he dealt with and what he felt that is a vocal performance that will just break you man that's an incredible choice he's 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 an absolute beast yeah especially his his work on temple of the dog and once again the backstory yes. there with their friend that died and all that stuff i always felt like he really especially bad motor finger era sound garden i always kind of felt like they were they were bringing, uh, they were kind of filling the Zeppelin role for a new generation. He was a crooner when that wasn't particularly like cool. Right. Um, they were not that heavy guitar tones, but like a lot of cool riffs playing with time signature. Um, yeah, Bad Motor Finger specifically to me is like the pinnacle of how rad they were, but I, I liked him back then. And then when they did the Temple of Dog stuff, I was just like, forget about it. This guy's insane. Mm -hmm. So well, good. 
I'm looking forward to uh, this pandemic being over with so we can just go find some comfortable chairs and a bunch of balcones and dig some music, talk about the music, talk about the whiskey, because this is a, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Absolutely. I, I want to yeah. I want to say one quick thing, too, that you guys are going to be jealous that you didn't think of it. And Ben made a mistake by not going with his original uh, initial instinct, even though Sturgill's a badass. When we were doing this on the air, the choice that Ben almost made which I was jealous of that I didn't make was Rakim mm. because we start thinking about melody and singing, but Rakim's voice is the yeah. choice instrument of all. Uh, yeah. You know. Did you guys ever listen to King's son? Oh yeah. Absolutely. King's son. Yeah. I always thought he reminded me a lot of Rakim's voice, like the closest I'd ever heard. Yeah. Uh, and he was actually someone. another 5% mm -hmm. nation rapper as well. Yeah. Ironically enough. And um, also Chuck, Chuck D I would put in a similar, like there's just something about that voice. That's just like, yeah, there was this uh, really cool article I remember from 20 something 30 years ago now where Chuck D was talking about he derived his rapping style, his projection of his voice from Pat Summerall doing NFL football. Oh, and really? He called it the voice of God. Wow. That when Pat Summerall <laughs> came on, he filled it up as the voice of God. And that had as much influence on Chuck D's projection That's as awesome. any other rapper that he ever came across, which I thought. Uh, that's cool. That's crazy. That's great. Uh, that's crazy. You, so are we doing this again tomorrow night? When do we do this again? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we have two more hours. Oh, is that uh, right? We're going all night. Hey, Skin, Skin ahead, said this earlier, and, uh, and I'm sorry to cut in here. Jared, you're an impossible guy to compliment. I know you'll brush it off immediately, but congratulations. You're brilliant. Your whiskey's fantastic, all Thanks. of it. And uh, it. you got some new additions. And uh, Alex, we love you. And uh, thank you for supporting us uh, all the time and uh, much continued sex to you. I, I will say one thing says. before I'll give one plug before we go. Of course. Uh, the, the Texas Whiskey Association, along mm -hmm. with the Te Texas Distilled Spirits Association, obviously stuff's crazy for a lot of people right now. And we're not begging the governor to let us get back open. We know some people aren't comfortable getting out. We don't want people out just so we can get some cash right. when it's maybe an unsafe time. But there are some other burdens on our industry that seem a little undue and that we're asking for some temporary relief or even permanent relief. Uh, one is the two bottle limit in Texas. If you come to the distillery, we've got to keep track of your ID. We can sell you two a month. If you go to a brewery, you can walk away with a couple cases. Winery, you can go get a, get a couple cases and even sign up for them to ship stuff to your door. Um, and we're not allowed to do any of that stuff. And some of our smaller producers in the Texas Whiskey Association are so small they don't even have distribution. Literally every dollar they make is through the front of house. And some of these limits just make it a little bit silly. Um, and they, for a state that really supports small business and believes in slightly smaller government with like less regulation on people's ability to make a living, these are things that seem a little uh, overdue to yeah. uh, kind of relax the burden on our industry. But the Texas Whiskey Association is just launched this week and we'll be putting it up on some about county stuff. Uh, sharing ways you can jump in and, and get letters to the right people as easily as possible. Um, we're going to try and raise some funds also for lobbying efforts for once session uh, picks back up in 2021 and state legislation stuff's going down and see if we can't make some of these changes permanent. So uh, yeah, hit up the Texas Whiskey Association or stillstrong.com, I think. Still strong, still strong, still strong Texas. Or if you go to balconies anywhere, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, we'll be sharing those links and asking people to either throw some money for legislative stuff next year to get some of the stuff changed or write letters. And uh, we've made it pretty easy. You can just kind of like put your info in and point click and be done and send stuff off to the governor and the TABC. So um, well, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, we want to get that message out. And I want to leave you guys with one last interactive message from a viewer who's a friend of mine and Ben's and he's we know him well good whiskey consumer, good beer consumer. He knows his stuff and he's watching. And this is why we do this Texas whiskey. Uh, it's a whiskey cast, isn't it? Is that what we're calling this? Yeah, sure. And he was sending some messages during the show and he said, he's listening to uh, Alex and Jared talk about Balcones. And he said, the love for the brand and heart they apply to the final drip into the bottle is amazing. Great people. This is how the American dream continues. And I thought he said it exactly right on point. This is why me and Ben feel blessed to be associated with you guys. We will advocate till the day that we die. 
thank you for making great, great whiskey and representing Texas in that fashion. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I can't wait to do this again. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. It's good to see you guys. I feel like you guys too. as weird as this felt when we first started doing these, now it feels normal. It's like, oh, yeah, I get to hang out with the guys tonight. Yeah, with yeah, you, no doubt. Maybe Thursday. The same. Hundreds of miles away. Cool. All Cheers, right. guys. See you guys. All right, later, boys. Take care. See ya.